center. Oh, what did I think? Go ahead, tell me. This meeting is being recorded by the host or participant. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. I think we're getting some ashes. Yeah. Oh. What we'll do is let's have everybody just mute real quick. Good deal. Perfect, perfect. So it looks like there we got it there. So what we'll do is just uh, we'll stay mute so we can figure out who, and then we'll come in. Whoever want, whoever's going to do the reading, just come in. You can unmute, and we'll just play it that way. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Just wave if you. Can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. 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 All righty. Will someone please just read the scripture for us? Mm -hmm. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all, all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me cover, recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Hmm. So basically, I wanted to bring this up because we had looked at the text in Matthew and basically it kind of showed us a similar story about two blind men basically in Jericho and Jesus performing the same thing. And we see basically they're actually the same story. So I wanted to kind of bring that out. And obviously, so, uh, Sister Anderson did a great job of actually talking about this man being in Jericho and actually kind of almost touching into those different accounts. So that's what I want to kind of look at for us tonight in this beginning start of the text, I mean, of the study. So will someone please read for us the account in Luke chapter 18, verses 35 through 43. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Hmm. So now oh, we we'll see, see Luke's account. And remember, basically, we talk about the Gospels as building upon themselves, as being synoptic. So we see here where it says, as he drew near to Jericho, we see that in Luke's account. So now let us go forth and let's look back at Matthew. Will somebody please read that for us? As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a loud crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the loudest, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them, what do you want me to do for you? He asked, Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they recovered, they received their sight and followed him. Hmm. So we see basically some, some differences in these accounts. Basically, we see one that says, as they drew near to Jericho, the other one says, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, we also have one of the gospel accounts say there were two blind men. Then we yeah. have a focus on one, specifically the one that was our homework was 
blind Bartimaeus was in it. So let us look at this, because basically it's not a confusing aspect. It's just we want to make sure that we have a good understanding of it. So what I want us to do is actually look at commentary. And basically it kind of looks at these, what I say, apparent discrepancies that they see about this particular text. Will someone please read that for us? And this is coming from Got Questions. In spite of apparent discrepancies, these three passages do refer to the same incident. The Matthew account cites two men healed as Jesus left Jericho. Mark and Luke refer to only one blind man healed, but Luke says it happened as Jesus was entering Jericho, while Mark records it happening as he left Jericho. There are legitimate explanations for the apparent discrepancies. Let's look at them rather than deciding this is a contradiction and the Bible is in error. That this is the same incident is seen in the similarities of the account, beginning with the two beggars sitting on the roadside. They call out to Jesus, referring to him as son of David, which is Matthew 20, 30, Mark 10, 48, and Luke 18, 38. And in all three accounts, they are rebuked by those nearby and told to be quiet, but continue to shout out to Jesus. Matthew 20, 31, Mark 10, 48, and Luke 18, 39. The three accounts describe nearly identical conversations between Jesus and the beggars, and the conclusion of the stories are, all, are also identical. The beggars receive their sight immediately and follow Jesus. So we see basically with the author kind of letting us see where these stories go and how they intertwine and connect but there still is no commentary. So will someone please read for us the commentary continued. Only Mark chooses to identify one of the beggars as Bartimaeus, perhaps because Bartimaeus was known to Mark's readers or they knew Bartimaeus' father, Timaeus, whereas the other blind man was a stranger to them. In any case, the fact that Mark and Luke only mention one beggar does not contradict Matthew's account. Mark and Luke never say there was only one beggar. They simply focus on the one Bartimaeus, who was probably the more vocal of the two. Matthew mm -hmm. refers to both of the blind men calling out to Jesus, clearly indicating there were two. The other issue in question is whether Jesus was entering Jericho or leaving it. Bible commentators cite the fact that at the time there were two Jerichos. One, the mound of the ancient city still existing today, and the other, the inhabited city of Jericho. Therefore, Jesus could have healed the two men as he was leaving the ancient city of Jericho and entering the new city of Jericho. Mm. So we see basically as we put it together, and that's, of course, if I put something in red, I always want to investigate it. So we're saying to Jericho. So before we go deeper, now we remember the first, that one Jericho, which one was that? The, the one made popular in Joshua. The great walled city, remember basically, of course, the one yeah. that was utterly destroyed. So we have that piece of it. And that basically was more heaped upon as a mound. Remember in certain time, in ancient times, they either built on top and they still do it in modern times too, especially in large cities, or they go to the side and actually start a community. And we see that was the case in Jericho. So that's why we see the mound of the old city, but then of course the industry of the new city. And just to get deeper in that, I actually want to go into a little commentary, not to just to go so far off, but just to give us a real true understanding about those two Jerichos. So will somebody please read for us? And I'll cover it up just because I want us to be able to read together, but it talks about two Jerichos. And this was from Britannia, which talks about Jericho and the West Bank. Will someone please read that for us? Jericho is famous in biblical history as the first town attacked by the Israelites under Joshua after they crossed the Jordan River. After its destruction by the Israelites, it was, according to the biblical account, abandoned until Heel, the Beth Bethelite, established himself there in the ninth century. BCE. Jericho is mentioned several other times in the Bible. Herod the Great established a winter residence at Jericho, and he died there in 4 BCE. 
evacuations conducted in excavations conducted in 1950 to 1951 reveals something of Herodin Jericho, a magnificent facet along the Wa'aliku is probably part of Herod's palace and its style illustrates Herod's devotion to Rome. Traces of other fine buildings can be seen in this area, which became the cent center of Roman and New Testament Jericho, approximately one mile south of that of the Old Testament town. Jericho of the Crusader period was on yet a third site, a mile east of the Old Testament site, and it was there that the modern town would later develop. Old Testament Jericho has been identified in the mound known as the Tal Asatun at the source of the Copious Spring, Alain Satin which raise, rises 70 feet above the surrounding plain. A number of major archaeological expeditions have worked at the site, notably in 1952 to 1958 under Kathleen M. Kenyon, director of the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. One of the main objectives has been to establish the date of the town's destruction by the Israelites, a matter of importance for the chronology of, chronology of the Israelites enter into Canaan. Hmm. So now we see those differences and how it makes sense. Because basically, if those beggars were in a certain position, we see where we could be bypassing the mound going into that newer city. So it makes sense, of course, this, and of course still connects those gospels. Questions or comments, though? Hmm. Good deal. And we all know what the BCE piece is, right? No. Okay. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it basically, yeah, because I know obviously we usually thank see you, BC, Sister Diane. <laughs> we usually see BC and AD. All it means yeah. is before the Common Era. So oh, okay. the calendar that we do use now is the Gregorian calendar. Obviously, January, February, March, April, May, all the way to December. So basically, this was before the creation of that time frame. So that's that's all it means. Just thank scholars you. trying to look scholarly. <laughs> okay. All righty. So let us continue in the vein of connecting those gospels together. And let's get back to that commentary. Will someone please read that for us? In any case, to focus on these mirror details to the exclusion of all else is to miss the point of the story. Jesus healed the blind man, proving that he was indeed the Son of God with powers beyond anything a mortal man. Could have, unlike the Pharisees who refused to see what was before their eyes, our response to Jesus should be the same as that of the blind man. Call on him to give us eyes to see spiritual truth, recognize him or who he is, and follow him. Hmm. So basically, the commentary brings us back to the real purpose of the story not to just pick out these minor details. And that's why I wanted to kind of make sure we put it all together, but actually to get to the heart of it and saying that when we do need Jesus, obviously cry out to them, recognizing that he can help us, that he can take care of us, but not only do that piece of it, because remember the text says that after he received, he followed it. So basically making sure that we complete all of that together. And that's basically what we're trying to get out of these, of course, the story that we are studying in Matthew as far as that gospel, but also connecting those other gospels that have this story as well. Not seeing them as inconsistencies. There were two men there. Basically, we see that the Matthew and text focus more so, uh, no, not the Matthew and text, but the uh, Luke and text focus more so on Bartimaeus. But even with that, it doesn't negate the fact that there were two calling out to Christ. And in that, they received their sight because they were looking to him. And that's kind of the central theme uh, that we get out of this, uh, out of the commentary and, of course, out of this gospel. Questions or comments, though? Okay. So now let us go and look at basically the story itself. And just wanted to look at some things with enduring words. And that basically looks and says, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, 
They knew this might be their last time to meet Jesus. They had the desperation appropriate for those who know that today is the day of salvation. Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. The earnestness of these men was marvelous. They were desperate to be healed and they ignored the crowd that tried to quiet them. They actually cried out all the more, Lord, son of David. However, in their desperation, they glorified Jesus. They gave him full honor with this title. Will someone continue reading? Jesus stood still. Nothing could stop him on his journey to Jerusalem, yet he stood still to answer a persistent plea for mercy. What do you want me to do for you? This is a wonderful, simple question God has not stopped asking. Sometimes we go without when God would want us to get, when God would want to give us something simply because we will not answer this question. And we do not have because we do not ask. James 4 and 2. Jesus asked this question with full knowledge that these men were blind. He knew that they needed, he knew what they needed and what they wanted. But God still wants us to tell him our needs as a constant expression of our trust and reliance on him. And they immediately followed him. This was a great result. Not only were they healed, but they also followed the one who did great things for them. Amen, amen. All right, so now that leads us to our first study question for the evening. And it said, what did the blind men request from the son of David? Their sight. Their sight. Mm -hmm. their, sight. their sight, exactly. So they requested Jesus to have mercy on them. That was the first, but remember, this request was twofold. Not only did they want his mercy, i.e. stop, Lord, help us, but you're right, they also wanted their sight. Okay. Got it? Got it. All right. Next, to our other study question, our second study question for the evening. It said, with what emotion did Jesus look upon the blind men? Compassion. Compassion, compassion, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Speak up. Look upon the men with compassion. And I was wondering, when I was looking through the study, I was like, why would that be such a good focus, you know, to kind of have us look at? I mean, obviously it says, and he looked upon them with compassion and of course, then he healed them. But it makes sense because I believe Jesus looks upon us the exact same way. When yeah. we have difficulty, when we have problems, he looks upon us with a compassionate eye and then takes care of our needs. So it was very, when I first was like, oh, that doesn't seem like a great question, but it really is because it puts us it in the really mindset to understand that this is how Christ also looks at us. Christ also looks at us. I think we're getting some reverb again. It's everybody muted. It's everybody muted. All right. Now let us get into our uh, study looking at Matthew, the 21st chapter going through the first through the ninth verse. Will someone please read that scripture for us? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, Say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Uh, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Mm. So we see basically Matthew 21 is opening us up, up to what is called the triumphal entry. Remember, Jesus is entering into Jerusalem. We speak to it a lot when we are in the time of Easter. So basically showing how Jesus came in and how he was received and people were calling Hosanna, you know, basically ripping down, uh, taking off their cloaks and things of that nature. But before we go deep into that piece of the triumphal entry, I really want us to look at 
where what was happening and why Jesus did this way. Remember, he was on a donkey. There was a cult there. But what did that all mean? And basically, we see, as highlighted in the red, these words. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So what I want us to look at is actually where this prophecy comes from. So we're going to look back to the Old Testament and basically look in Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verses 9 through 13. And will somebody please read that for us? Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the fold of a donkey. I will take away, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the water, waterless pit. Remember, excuse me, return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will, I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Hmm. So we see specifically where the context of this prophecy comes from, Zechariah 9. And I, like, I pulled out this particular piece for us, obviously to see where the word is came from, but also to see where the contrast is. As we see basically here in Zechariah, he's talking about the uh, Messiah coming in or the king coming in, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt of a foal. But then he goes in and says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. So he gives us that contrast because instead of coming in on a horse, when a leader came in on a horse going into a city, they were coming in as conquerors. But Jesus was coming in as king, as a prince, more so of peace, a peaceful one, but he was establishing. And that was the different contrast that we see between coming in on a donkey and coming in on a horse. So I love how Zachariah pretty much placed that to us. Any thoughts about that or any comments? Okay, let us continue. So... What I wanted to pick out with this is basically continue to look deeper into the idea or the aspect of why a donkey was chosen for transport. Of course, I just like I mentioned before, remember coming in on a horse was usually a war horse. So you're looking as a conqueror. But next, we're looking at what the donkey signified and what all of that meant as far as what when Jesus rode in in that triumphal entry. So will someone please read that for us, basically coming from Bible tools, speaking about the donkey. I was Wallow, on, go ahead. Wallow, go ahead, Deacon. <laughs> Why was a donkey the chosen means of transport? How much planning and forethought did God give to this one seemingly insignificant detail? Contrary to com common perception, donkeys are anything but stupid. In fact, once their owner gains their trust, they can be willing and companionable partners and very dependable. It is said that they actually do not work their best unless they trust the one they are working for. Mm -hmm. Once they feel comfortable with the owner, donkeys will do almost anything within their limits. And as a bonus, they need minimal training. Cool. All right, let us just keep going. Will someone continue to read about the donkey? Donkeys were used throughout the times of the Bible, according to the Dictionary of Biblical Imagery. The riding of a donkey was a sign of royalty. From the archives dug up in the Babylonian city of Mar, it was learned that the riding of a donkey for entry into a city was an act of kingship. The donkey and the mule were a staple in the Near Eastern royal ceremonies as well. 
Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem while riding on a donkey was not just an afterthought using whatever beast was available. This was a well-considered part of God's plan for a specific purpose. Although the use of the donkey was widespread in those times, Jesus riding on the donkey did not show him to be a poor or common man, but a king, just as the Mar archives show was commonly understood across the Middle East. And I'll continue. So Jesus riding on a donkey fulfills the characterization shown in Zechariah 9 and 9, that the king would be lowly. This symbolic character of the donkey as an animal used for peaceful purposes stand in marked contrast to a horse whose imagery associates with war. A man riding on a donkey is not looking for war. And in Jesus's case, he came instead to save, carried on perhaps the lowliest of animals. So we see basically that big significant of this text where Jesus commands those two disciples to go ahead and get the donkey. And obviously the colt is with her too as well. And they bring him to him. And in order for him to ride, of course, they place their garments on him. And of course, he enters in triumphantly into Jerusalem. But each and every aspect coincides with scripture, i.e. prophecy. Remember, we see that prophecy of Zechariah that basically speaks to this and truly announces him as the Messiah, the leader truly of the world. Thoughts or comments? All right. Well, let us continue to go forth. And now let us look at a little bit of Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. Will someone please read that for us? This is another account of that triumphal entry. <laughs> When he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mound that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the coat, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they <clears throat> they spread their cloaks on the on the road as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in, in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. <laughs> Amen. So we see basically Luke's account. Remember, we always speak about Luke's gospel being that more exquisite, exquisite excuse me, and more descriptive of gospel, just because, of course, we know Luke was a learned guy. They say that great physician. In this, basically, we see that we get a little more detail about the event. So remember, this is still connecting the Gospels. Obviously, we read Matthew. Now we're looking at Luke. One thing that I find that is interesting in this basically is Luke actually highlights the reaction of the Pharisees and basically how the Pharisees already didn't like Christ. So them asking him to rebuke his disciples basically was for their benefit, because they saw him as being too popular. They saw him as kind of, in essence, taking their thunder. But I love the answer. We say it all the time. He said, well, they didn't say anything. Then, of course, the rocks would cry out. The stones would cry out because Messiah is here. The fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah is in front of your face. And you just want to go about promoting your own agenda. You know, so I, I tell you, it's just an awesome thing to see basically uh, these events unfold and how these things connect. So let us also, again, look at John's account of this triumphal entry. Will someone please read? 
The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples did not understand this, these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Mm. So we see basically John's uh, account, and pretty, pretty similar, obviously. John also highlights those Pharisees, basically. And he ca it kind of foreshadows what's going to happen. Well, Jesus kind of already told us. We talked about it in our, uh, you know, our lead question as far as our recap. Basically, when he said that he was going to be placed in the hands of the officials, that he was going to be killed. So this is just further evidence of seeing that undercurrent where the officials are seeing Jesus come in and they're just angry. You know, they're saying this guy, this upstart's coming in and kind of taking what we've established here. And you see them kind of talking about him in these texts and we see these pieces of it. With John, basically, we also see one thing that we all harp on during this time of the season, basically during that triumphal entry. And that's basically in verse 13 where we see that they cut palm tree or palm fronds down and laid them and went out to meet him. And we also oh, highlight this, of course, Palm Sunday, <laughs> basically highlighting that, that piece of that triumphal entry. We see that found in John's account of the text. So it kind of puts the story completely together. We see basically Jesus coming in. We see how Luke basically gave us the uh, understanding of them. going. I mean, Matthew gave us the understanding of them going to release the animal. Of course, we see how Luke highlights that more and shows us the undercurrent of the Pharisees. And next, basically, John continues in that same vein and shows us that same treachery that's starting to be established, even with Jesus entering as triumphant Messiah. Thoughts or comments? You're going to mute it. Right, Y'all quiet on me tonight, but hey. <laughs> A lot of good information. <laughs> <laughs> so next, let us go with the last uh, piece that looks at uh, this triumphal entry. And we're looking at Mark 11, 1 through 11. And will someone please read that for us? <laughs> As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Hmm. So we see this last account of it, basically Mark's account. Of course, like I said, again, highlighting, uh, you know, them going to receive the cult. And we see them shouting Hosanna. And one thing we wanted to look at, remember we're, we're talking about in, in Matthew, we talk about two animals. Obviously in Mark and in John, we're seeing that it just has that focus on the cult. 
And this is the same idea. The focus is just put in that area. It's not to deny the fact that it was a donkey and her cult. So with that said, I basically wanted us to look deeper at this triumphal entry. And basically this commentary comes from Got Questions. Will someone please read for us this commentary? The triumphal entry is that of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on what we know as Palm Sunday. The Sunday before the crucifixion, John 12, 1, 12. The story of the triumphal entry is one of the few in incidents in the life of Jesus, which appears in all four gospel accounts. Matthew 21, 1 through 17, Mark 11, 1 through 11, Luke 19, 29 through 40, and John 12, John 12, 12 through 19. Putting the four accounts together, it becomes clear that the triumphal entry was a significant event not only to the people of Jesus' day, but to Christians throughout history. We celebrate Palm Sunday to remember that momentous occasion. On that day, Jesus rolled into Jerusalem on the back of a borrowed donkey's coat, on that one that had never been written before. The disciples spread their cloaks on the donkey for Jesus to sit on, and the multitudes came out to welcome him, laying before him their cloaks and, their, and the branches of palm trees. The people hailed and praised him as the king who comes in the name of the Lord as he rolled to the temple where he had taught the people, healed them, and drove out the money changers and merchants who made his father's house a den of robbers. Mark eleven seventeen. 17. Sorry. All righty. Will someone continue to read that commentary for us? Go ahead. Jesus' purpose in riding into Jerusalem was to make public his claim to be their Messiah and King of Israel in, in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. Matthew says that the king coming on the foal of a donkey was an exact fulfillment of Zechariah. Oh, I lost my place. Nine, nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. Jesus, ride, Jesus rides into his capital city as a conquering king and is hailed by the people as such. In the manner of the day, the streets of Jerusalem, the royal city, are open to him like a king, he ascends to his palace, not a temporary palace, but the spiritual palace that is the temple because he, his is a spiritual kingdom. He receives the worship and praise of the people because only he deserves it. No longer does he tell his disciples to be quiet about him, Matthew 12, 16 and 16 and 20, but to shout his praises and worship him openly. The spreading of cloaks was an act of homage for royalty. See 2 Kings, the ninth chapter, verse 13. Jesus was openly declaring of the people that he was their king and the Messiah they had been waiting for. Hmm. So we see, uh, yeah. So we see here how the author basically reiterates all that we've learned in the connectivity of those gospels. And it was right. one thing when I was looking at this commentary that I didn't even really think about because remember all those times, especially now we're in Matthew 21 that we've seen in those other chapters of Matthew where Jesus basically kind of tells them the same thing. Or Jesus tells them, you know, to keep quiet about what they see. We talk about the transfiguration and things of that nature. But now here, it's like, it's all on the table. You know, I am Messiah. I am here. Worship me openly. This is why I came. And he knew that his time was still nigh because obviously we talk about this Palm Sunday celebration, i.e. the triumphal entry. But we know that leads up to the time of his walk to the cross. So Jesus was making sure that he maximized it and it was just all out. So that, that was definitely an interesting piece that I didn't even think about uh, that was kind of highlighted in this piece of commentary that kind of like really reiterated just the power and the voice of Christ. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Well, my, my thought was that 
Okay, he's already told his disciples three times that we know of <laughs> that, that what was going to happen to him when he gets there. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's time that he, instead of um, having them keep quiet about who he is, it's time for him to really show or have them go out and, and tell everybody who he is. He's not mm -hmm. really hiding it anymore because right. this is, he's on his way to die. Amen. Amen. You know, he's, he's, he's getting ready to die. So it's time that they, well, they should have known all along because he, <laughs> right. he told them who he was and he showed them who he was, but mm -hmm. it's no, there's no point in keeping quiet anymore mm -hmm. because everything is about to happen. Amen. Amen. That's exactly it. Yes. Yes. Oh, go ahead. I'm and, sorry. Oh, and another thing I just wanted to ask or comment, because mm -hmm. now in this commentary, it says he, he's riding in as a conquering king. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but then the, the uh, well, I guess when it's saying conquering, mm -hmm. I'm looking at it because, you know, the prophecy says that he was the lowly, Correct. You know, he was coming in on a donkey and like when you just explained that the donkey was viewed more as a royal beast and yeah. uh, you know and peace so what when it says a conquering king mm -hmm. what is that what is that telling me yeah so basically remember we're looking at the views of a commentary you know so what he was trying to really say here is that when jesus came in he was showing his regalness you know he might not okay. have used the exact words because when we think of concrete when we think of the war horse coming in right. and, attacking and all that but i think that what the commentary was just saying hey his royalty he was he's the king he let everybody know so i think it was just the words that he used because it wasn't okay. that he was conquering jerusalem but that he was in essence saving jerusalem you know because he was coming in peaceably so i think it was more so the word yeah i picked up yeah very good good eye <laughs> other thoughts All righty, let's keep it going. So now we get to study question 1J. And obviously we've looked at all of the gospel's connectivity and it says, why did Jesus send two disciples into a nearby village? To collect the donkeys. Right, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Answer, he sent them to acquire a donkey. <laughs> yes. That is exactly why they went. Remember, he sent two disciples in and he told them, hey, you're going to find them tied up. And if someone okay. asks you, the master has need of them. And they'll say, you know what? He does. Take them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the people believed them and let the donkeys go with them. Exactly. I mean, so that was really great. So many accounts. No, go ahead. Keep going. Oh, no, that okay. was great. <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> no, I just like it because I mean, it, 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 these types of screen, that's why, I mean, you can just get so deep in it because mm -hmm. we, as humans, if somebody was taking our donkeys, they're stealing. We <laughs> them, you know? <laughs> but we know that Jesus, made, that's why he preempted them because he knew exactly the hearts and the mindset of the owners. So, I mean, it, it was all set. It was all meant to happen. And it's not by coincidence or by happenstance. Basically, it was meant because he is truly the savior of the world. And that's why it all fell into play. Mm -hmm. You also, and then I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> when they took these animals, obviously they were domesticated, but they didn't know these men. You know what I mean? So uh, right. brown mules and doggies, they're not, I mean, they're smart, but they are the nicest at times. You know what I mean? So it just plays all into that understanding mm -hmm. that this was, what was meant to be as far as in that triumphal entry. And then I'm going to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I made a dump is in Saragorda. Mm -hmm. When we go to um, North Carolina mm -hmm. and we're walking on the street where I was raised, these, they have two donkeys and we always messing with them people donkey, not really messing, messing, <laughs> but it's like we think about the story of Jesus and we're mm -hmm. always looking at the donkeys and talking to the donkeys, you know, and they looking at us like, hmm, for real? You want me to conversate with you? <laughs> but it's just a reminder, you know, when you see right. things and you think about it, it's like, oh yeah, the donkey's in the Bible. Yeah. No, that's true. You're right about it. You're right about it. <laughs> it had to be a rough ride. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, any other comments before we go forth? No. 
Okay. All right. One, one thing I want to say is I, I thought was unique that the donkeys, the donkey had never been sat on. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. And yet, you know, he rode the donkey into the city. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's unique because you, who would even get on an animal that's not, <laughs> had not been broken? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They and usually fuck you right off. Been, mm -hmm. been, yeah, exactly, hadn't been sat on. Mm -hmm. wow. No, no, that was awesome. I mean, there's just it's so it's so rich. You know what I mean? It's just so, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, I like, like Easter time, obviously. And I know we only usually talk about these texts at that time, or we're in a study. Mm -hmm. It just has so much in there about what, uh, obviously, prophecy fulfillment, what Jesus did, and what he really means to us. It's just. It, it's just awesome. I mean, it, it just really is a really mm -hmm. good and interesting study. Really, really good. Any other thoughts? All right. Well, let's go into study question 2J. And it says, what prophecy was fulfilled as Jesus entered into Jerusalem? <laughs> no, that fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy of Jesus as king. Mm -hmm. Right. And where do, where do we find that at? Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, that is correct. So basically, coming in is, on donkey. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. I keep jumping in. Y'all just in. saying <laughs> that, that the king would be coming in on a donkey, riding a donkey. So That's it. That is correct. So basically, the prophecy, both, both are exactly right. As noted in Zechariah 9, 9, uh, him coming into the city on a donkey, a colt, actually a foal, a young donkey, you know what I mean, basically in that. So yes. All right. Basically, let us just uh, continue with Matthew, the 21st um, uh, chapter, verses 12 through 17. And we're going to leave this basically as what we're going to stop tonight. But I definitely just want to get this piece in because we see Jesus in a different light. So let us just please read. Someone please read. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money ch changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But, but when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple court, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of a children and infants, infants you? Lord, have you called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Beth, to Bethany where he spent the night. Hmm. So we see he comes in as uh, that king basically coming in. Then he goes into the temple and he saw people doing things they shouldn't be doing in the temple, exchanging money, basically having people buy what they're looking at, you know, the uh, things that are necessary for proper worship, but at inflated prices. And we're going to get deeper into that as we go deeper into this study. But obviously he yells at them and tells them to get out. You know, basically you've made them uh, this uh, house of the den of robbers versus the house of prayer. But the one thing I want to look at, and I want you just to highlight right there is this 15th verse where it said that the chief priests basically uh, were indignant. And of course, we talked about that earlier about the disciples being indignant about the sons of Zebedee. Remember, basically they were annoyed and upset that they would ask such a, have such a request from Christ. And these guys, and they were annoyed and upset for good reason because Jesus had already reprimanded them about that. They knew better. But then we have these people who are annoyed and upset because of their own selfishness, you know, basically mm -hmm. upset that Jesus is, you know, coming in and taking, you know, what they feel the glory that should be established to them. You know, they were the lead scholars. They were the lead rabbis. So basically he says, do you hear what these children are saying? You know, calling you son of David, Hosanna. And of course, Jesus puts them back to scripture and says, you know, basically shows how he is the fulfillment of that scripture, you know, so putting it back and letting them know who he truly is and keeps reiterating to that 
that to them. And as we know, because we know where scripture leads, how just upset and of course, increasingly indignant they get at the master because of it, which of course leads to that march to the cross. So thoughts or comments for this evening at all? Any, any, anything to say? Hmm. Yeah. Beautiful, informative lesson. Yes. yes, I agree. I will agree. Yeah, I tell you, this gives us so much, you know what I mean? It, it's so rich. right. Oh, yes. And I really like it because I love the, the Easter time as far as in really looking at those and really digging out and kind of cleaving to it because it really just speaks so much to, to Christ and his sacrifice and obviously that what that really means in turning to us. So, yeah, it's, it's this excitement. I love this this study. So it was, it was uh -huh. good. <laughs> uh -huh. It's a good one. Cool, cool. Amen. Yes. All right. All righty. Well, everybody is all right. Could I just have uh, Deacon uh, Daryl, will you please pray us out tonight? <laughs> He's muted. Nope. You are muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us together. Lord, thank yes. you for utilizing a tool in your arsenal to <laughs> teach, inspire, and inspire. Thank you for Pastor Stacy. And Lord, we just want to ask you for grace and mercy. And thank you for your grace and mercy. Amen. Yes. Lord, yes. Thank you for all of our blessings. Lord, I pray that you know you keep us safe, keep us out of harm's way. Lord, I pray that. Uh, for traveling grace for the Jacksons. Amen. Yes. Lord. Yeah. Just, just keep us binded together, Lord. Keep us in your word. Guide us throughout the week. Lord, this I pray on this night in your name. Amen. 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 Truly, God bless each and every one of you. Like I said, continue to just be great students of the word. I just enjoy your interactions and just the good mm. times that we have with this. This is, this is a good meeting. True. Just happy to see Sister Faye. Thank you so much. Amen. We enjoyed your presence tonight and just happy yes. uh, that you joined us. And uh, yes, looking yes. forward to continuing. So definitely uh, happy. Amen. Definitely. All right. Well, everyone have a good so evening. Especially yes. the Jackson, stay warm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Got my long johns. <laughs> we are Enjoy definitely going to be warm here in Florida, right? Amen. 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 Yes. God yes. bless you. Know you have a good one. Okay. Thank All right. right. Good night. Good night. Hello to First Lady Pamela. Hey, we'll do. We'll do. <laughs> good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Let us join you. Good night. We look forward to Wednesday nights. <laughs> Amen. 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 Uh, bye.